less than 10% of plastic is actually being recycled globally. As consumers, we are concerned now about our environment. So we don't want marketing and advertising to just tell us how great we are if we are you know, using a certain brand. Stories have driven people together for centuries now. And dialogues have led to the development of the world as we know it today. This is why we're introducing our new podcast series, Impact Dialogues, geared towards the new age generation in mind, where storytelling meets purpose. Together, we'll exchange stories with change makers who work with people and communities to improve their lives and ultimately the world. I have amongst us Wilma Rodriguez, who is a profound, profound inspiration on all of us here. Working as a socio entrepreneur for over two decades, Wilma specializes in holistic and sustainable waste management. Her efforts led to Saha Zero Waste, which began as an NGO, but is now a full fledged, thriving business that helps other organizations deal with their waste sustainably. Thank you so much for joining us, Wilma. Thank you. There's garbage and then there is waste. Yeah. What is the difference between the two? And what is the importance of that difference too? Because most of us fail to acknowledge that there is a difference. So garbage is this big heap of, you know, mountains of waste that we see in our landfills or what we see in our dump sites on the road, on the streets, uh, this mixed waste, which you can't make any sense of and which you just have to you know, burn, sometimes in the open, sometimes in waste to energy plants, put in landfills, that's garbage. But waste is materials. Waste is something which is, you know, we have used something and as a result of that, there are products that are created that we don't have any use for. That is waste which can actually go through different uh, layers of collection, sorting, aggregation, and then recycling to bring it back. So that is a difference between garbage and waste. Waste is something that you put back. Garbage is something that you discard and you know you, you dump it and you don't have a, a, a way in which that will come back to use. Right. Could you give us any examples that uh, in, in which ways we can utilize the waste again? Yeah. So when you cook in your kitchen, right? So there you have all the lovely peels, the vegetable peels, you have an orange peel and you can put it to so many different types of uses including making a bioenzyme for cleaning. You can use all our vegetable peels to go into a compost where you can put it back to the soil. The soil is where we get all our food from and we've depleted the soils over all of these millions of years and now we again need to enrich our soils Compost does that so beautifully, yeah? And then, of course, all the other materials, which is paper and plastic, uh, we need to bring it back to use, recycle it, uh, so that it does not get thrown into garbage dumps. So, Wilma, we have sustainable development goals, defining the very actions that we've been taking collectively as a world to improve this place for everyone. And one of those SDGs is around um, reducing global waste. And part of that discourse is around zero waste. For those of us who are not exactly sure of what that means, could you please help explain that to us? Where did it come from? Did it come from the SDGs or did it exist before then as well? And if so, what does it look like in the Indian context? Yeah, so, um, you know, the concept of zero waste is quite a nice theory. Yeah. Uh, and when I say theory, because, you know, right now, that's what it seems to be. You know, that here is a society that over the last uh, 50, 60, 100 years has incrementally increased consumption. And uh, on that account, we have large problems around waste. Now, SDG, definitely all, uh, uh, quite a few of the SDGs talk about reduction in consumption. So therefore, definitely our attention to waste is very closely associated with the SDGs. Now, when we say zero waste, we mean that we bring back all the materials that we have used in our consumption, put it back, bring it back to our soils, bring it back to our manufacturing, 
and bring it back to us for use. So really, we have to be a very conscious consumer when we look at consumption. So to break it down and make it very simple, uh, we have in India about 62 million tons of waste generated every year. And about 60% is organic in nature. And there is the paper, plastic, metal, glass, which we defined as uh, recyclable or dry waste. And then there are the fractions of sani waste and hazardous waste. Now, if we were to have a zero waste lifestyle, we would really want to cut down all our single use items. Because that's where, you know, you have so much of consumption and materials being used. So things like, you know, simple things, day-to-day -day things, paper cups, tissues, the cutlery, we would not want to have that in our lives. So reduce the, uh, the single use, but make sure that whatever we do use comes back. So you would compost your organic waste and you could compost it at home. You would uh, reduce your use of things like plastic bags or single use items, carry your own shopping bag. So there are so many things that one can do to have a zero waste lifestyle, but it has to be more than an intent. It has to be a change in lifestyle, which is going to not really cause any inconvenience. We've got to look at it as enhancing our lifestyle. That's true. And where did this uh, concept come about from? Was it uh, here not, before SDGs or? Yeah, it's coming from the fact that we all now know that consumption is, is causing a lot of problems to the environment. The fact that, you know, we are extracting materials to feed into that consumption. And so we've got to go back to where, you know, 40, 50 years where we did not have these kind of consumption levels. So it's a movement across the world to, to bring attention to the problems around excessive consumption. So Wilma, uh, your career trajectory has been very interesting. You began as a tour guide, then became a journalist, and now you're a social entrepreneur. And you were one of the first ones to do what you did back in 2013. What, what was that journey like? Could you tell us about it? Yeah, so you mentioned tour guide, right? And so actually that was the beginning of the journey for waste because, you know, there was this situation when, you know, you are showing as a guide the best of your country, right? And India for me was so much to offer to all kinds of tourists. And there was a very often, and there's one incident when, when we were at the Madurai temple, uh, uh, the Meenakshi temple in Madurai, uh, where, you know, you kind of celebrate the architecture, um, but at the same time you step out of the temple, and this was in the early 80s that I'm talking about, we stepped out of the temple with this huge uh, waste dump that was there even in the 80s. And then, you know, you do have tourists saying, I, and that was the time when I was in my 20s and had to confront the fact that India was quite uh, negligent in its waste management. So from that point of wanting to do something to then 2001, when we had for the first time in India, the municipal solid waste rules. Uh, the municipal solid waste rules talked about waste, talked about how waste is a resource and should come back to use and should not be put into dump site, should not become garbage in a dump site. Uh, and so there, this was the, the starting point for me to step in to actually elicit change that was required. So first we started uh, Sahas as an NGO because unfortunately or fortunately, you know, it was the NGO sector that was expected to provide solutions for waste management. So we started with the, uh, with the focus on reduce. So reduce consumption of plastic. We had a campaign called Less Plastic for Me to really support people who wanted to reduce their plastic footprint. But over a few years, we realized that, you know, the NGO sector cannot be the answer to waste management uh, because waste management does need a lot of more complex interventions. It does need infrastructure. It needs behavioral change. It needs uh, good uh, uh, back-end systems in terms of processing, in terms of uh, recycling uh, technologies. And therefore, the NGO can play an important, significant role, but not a complete solution. Uh, so in 2013, we, we had a second entity for Sahas, which was registered as a 
फॉर प्रॉफिट बिजनेस मॉडल या साहस वेस्ट मैनेजमेंट प्राइवेट लिमिटेड और साहस जीरो वेस्ट नाउ द आइडिया ऑफ अ बिजनेस मॉडल इज टू प्रोवाइड होलिस्टिक सर्विसेज एंड एंड टू एंड सर्विसेज एंड कंटिन्यूस सर्विसेज लाइक एनी अदर यू नो डिलीवरी ऑफ एनी सर्विस वेस्ट मैनेजमेंट आल्सो कम्स इनटू दैट इनटू दैट डोमेन ऑफ अ सर्विस डिलीवरी एंड एज अ बिजनेस मॉडल एज अ सोशल एंटरप्राइज द फर्स्ट focus is on environmental and social impact right yeah so when you look at environment and the impact the focus is on resource recovery the focus is on no waste going to a dump site mm-hmm. bring your waste going to landfill to as low as 5% and that's where we were offering services to bulk generators to corporate campuses to large apartments you know to make sure that all the waste which is organic uh um, gets composted or goes into bio cng all your dry waste that's collected sorted aggregated does not go into any dump site or landfill but goes into proper processing mm-hmm. of course reduce becomes the big important part and in all of these uh solutions that we had the generator had to be equally responsible so the generator was there as our customer and we were responsible the joint partnership to make sure that the waste generated is tracked traced processed and doesn't go into a, a environmental degradation kind of situation so that is what we are even today saha zero waste as a business as a as a business model but a social enterprise we balance both of these things right, together right that sounds like quite a journey and i'm sure there must have been challenges around that area as well considering that you were one of the first business models around uh, yes. this kind of work yes. can you tell us uh, any challenges that you may have faced now the challenges that we face were that people were not willing to pay a service fee and that is you know so sad in india believe that we have a large informal sector and we are doing this great job we are providing a livelihood but a livelihood is so that people can actually have a house can send their children to school can be have access to health and you know our informal sector are not able to do that so when i am you know saying that we provide through this business model and we have a team of 300 now these 70% of them are from the base of the pyramid and i am still saying that you know the satisfaction point is and we are paying them minimum wages that's not what it's meant to be because if you look at minimum wages it's still too low in bangalore which is one of the biggest cities that prov- that has a good structure around minimum wages it's about 18000 rupees minimum wages but after you cut off esi pf what they get in hand is barely about 13 to 14k in a city like bangalore yes yeah so definitely india has to do better and definitely the waste generators are middle class are of a middle class even our low middle class should be conscious of the fact that you know the environment uh, problems come about because we are not taking care of waste and we need to take care of people working with waste so wilma in your experience you worked quite a lot with marginalized communities especially uh, people who were uh, previously informal employees but are now formal employees of sahas and i'm sure in your interactions with other sectors where there is informal employment you must have had a lot of experience there and i'm sure that there are stories behind all those people working in that sector do you have any stories that you can share with us now you know it is unfortunate that we have these large number of people working informally Uh, they would receive waste from various different sources large corporate offices apartment complexes even hospitals yeah and that is a that is actually quite illegal because remember we've got good waste management rules that accept and acknowledges that people should get paid should work with proper infrastructure and definitely should not work in the kind of waste picker colonies that we see but really we need to you know i would really encourage people because in every city and even in our in our smaller cities we have these you know little colonies where people start with their hands actually sorting waste 
And this is most often waste which is contaminated with organic uh, stuff. For instance, a hotel, let me just say even a five-star hotel very often gives its waste to an informal sector, I would say to a contractor or to somebody working informally. And this waste then comes to a waste picker colony. And in this waste picker colony, you do have children, you know, who are there as part of the families of waste pickers. Um, very often you see animals, you know, dogs and, you know, all kinds of animals also there picking out on some kind of organic stuff that comes in. And in that you will have sanitary waste. Most hospitals sometimes, again, illegally, the smaller clinics, etc. The waste comes in there and very often you even see syringes in that situation. Yeah, so this is, and, and we work to change that. Now that zero waste is becoming a movement, it's not only about waste disposal, right? It's about zero waste living, as you had mentioned before. And more and more younger people are getting involved in the conversation because everyone wants a positive change and everyone wants to be involved in that movement. Yes, yes. And with policies like Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, with uh, SDGs guiding all of our actions towards making this world a better place, where do you see this industry going in terms of uh, the data surrounding it? What kind of data do we need to tackle um, our waste? And if we have that kind of data, what do we do with it? Yeah, so on zero waste, so, you know, you said a movement. Okay, but I think it's far from a movement currently. It's a, it's a great idea. It's a good intention. Yeah, but when we say zero waste, we would expect people's behaviors to change. Uh, for instance, today, I'll just give you a very simple example. Tissues are still so, you know, used so extensively. Yeah, whether it's in an airport, uh, in a restaurant, uh, in a, in a, you know, to wipe our hands. Uh, we can't seem to, uh, you know, have a get together without using tissues. So what are we talking about when we say zero waste? Is it not possible for us to have the handkerchief as a, as a symbol of convenience rather than this tissues or these paper cups or these one-time use cutlery, which has to travel long distances in order for it to bring that convenience to us. Mm -hmm. And then if it has to travel again, you know, really a long distance for it to be recycled, most often it gets contaminated with organics and then you can forget any form of recycling. So the zero waste movement, if we have to call it that, has to be around a big shift in our behavior. And this shift in our behavior comes from regulations because then you will see, you know, that tissues are not made so easily accessible to us. There will be a big price point around it, which will be a deterrent. And you will see that, you know, then you will see things really changing. But right now, the zero waste movement is a good to have, good intentions, but far from, you know, really bringing about the kind of behavioral change. Because even with our use of packaging, you know, we still want to see industry start embracing reuse. Right. Yeah. We would want to see the beverage industry not put out so many bottles and say, okay, I'm moving from, you know, plastic to uh, another material. Some of them are saying to paper. And between paper and plastic, both of them are equally monstrous, if I might use a strong word. Yeah, because we know the paper footprint. We know the amount of materials that are used to produce the paper. So in this zero waste movement, we will need policy, we will need government, we will need uh, industry, and we'll need the consumer working together to actually enable that to happen. Yeah. So also when you look at uh, the world economy, the world economy, if it is around give or take, uh, it's around a hundred trillion dollars, yeah? And 50% of that economy actually comes from nature, yeah? So you have our clothing, our food, all the manufacturing uh, raw materials coming from nature. And yet in today's economy, we talk circular economy, 
but we are not closing the loop by putting things back to nature. Yeah, so just to come back to what you were asking on the data, uh, the fact is that we would, I don't think we are really putting our minds to actually bringing out the right data points. Right. Yeah. We have been told over the last 40, 50 years that plastic can be recycled. Yeah. And so therefore this explosive use of plastic. Mm -hmm. But we know today that less than 10% of plastic is actually being recycled globally. Yeah. In India, the plastic recycling rates are slightly better, but they're still dismally very low because you have mostly items like your bottles, PT bottles, mm -hmm. or your rigid shampoo uh, uh, bottles, which are being recycled. Now, the larger part of plastic waste is the flexibles, is the packaging of uh, biscuits and chips, etc., which is getting neglected. And also the manner in which I've already described the informal sector who have been responsible largely for recycling. So all of that data is available, is there in bits and pieces, but we really need to push it out there so that, you know, that informed decisions are being taken. Yeah. And when I say informed decisions, it means that definitely industry has to make some changes so that this waste which comes out of their businesses is equally addressed. Yeah, you may know that the policy today is talking of extended producer responsibility. And extended producer responsibility is focusing on plastic waste, is focusing on electronic waste. It needs to be there for all kinds of end of life materials. Definitely for paper, definitely for glass, Definitely for textile waste. Today, most of our textiles is got 50, 60, 70% plastic in it. Yeah, a lot of it is when it's washed, is going into, you know, sewage systems and then to riverines, etc. as microplastic. So imagine if we put all of this under scrutiny with, you know, brands, etc. declaring how much of plastic is there in their textiles. With brands declaring in their packaging how much of it is paper, how much of it is plastic, and therefore what one is expected to do. Right now they just put a little symbol saying recyclable and you know that they get away with it. So we want more disclosures. Yeah, because we are, as consumers, we are concerned now about our environment. So we don't want marketing and advertising to just tell us how great we are if we are, you know, using a certain brand. What is it doing to our environment should also be disclosed in that product. And then we make our choices. And that's the kind of data we need. And that's the kind of data we need. Right, right. This has been an absolute pleasure, Wilma. It has been a great conversation, a stimulating conversation, and we've learned a lot. And I hope we can say the same for our audiences. Thank you so much for your time. We're Thank very, you. very glad. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. We spoke to Wilma Rodriguez about the work that she and her team have been doing. There was so much that I didn't know about waste management that I got to know from our conversation today, which is what Impact Dialogues is all about tracking change makers and the transformation they bring into our lives. Thank you for joining us today. Stay tuned for the next episode.